The Honorable Isolina Philip, Junior Minister in the Ministry of Social Development, Youth Empowerment, Gender Affairs, Aging and Disabilities to speak with us about CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Minister Philip is an expert in gender affairs and social justice and has worked with the government to implement projects and programs that help improve social well-being and, and the protection of human rights. We are grateful for her participation in CEDAW and look forward to her enlightening us on this. Minister Philip, welcome back to a Good Morning SKN. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here. I know, thank she's you. becoming a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> so how has the last three months been for you? Um, the last few months have been pretty interesting. You know, I'm uh, on the job, learning on the job as I go, but, you know, it's actually been um, very overwhelming with just the supports and encouragement. I think, you know, it's... Um, People have been very gracious and very patient, and I've also been patient, you know, uh, just kind of being new to the government system of things. But I am feeling ever more confident as I go from day to day. And so, and I think, you know, there's definitely a lot of work to be done, but I'm not intimidated by the work to be done because I think it's all possible. Uh, there's a lot of hope. I, I like the spunk, I like yeah. the brightness, and a little birdie told me that they miss you, but I'll tell you who the birdie is. <laughs> <laughs> That's very exciting to hear. So I think one of the big questions is, what is CEDA, both in terms of the convention and the treaty itself? Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned, uh, so CEDA is the convention, so it's a UN convention mm -hmm. on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And so in, it's essentially it's like an international bill of rights. Um, and that we had, uh, it was passed in the UN General Assembly. Um, and the objective was essentially to uh, in, in, implement some obligations for state parties who decide to sign on to say that they're committed to eliminating all forms of discrimination against women and protecting um, women as an identifying these freedoms as human rights. And so essentially the convention, then it, there's a committee that was formed. So there's a committee on the convention of the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And um, this committee essentially is manned with the objective of kind of looking at state parties and holding the state parties accountable to these obligations that they've signed on to. And so it sets an agenda for national actions to implement different measures to see how we can eliminate institutional, structural, cultural, socioeconomic barriers mm -hmm. that would potentially be um, preventing women from participating equally or being protected mm -hmm. right. um, from any form of discrimination in society. Good stuff. So how often do, does these reviews happen? Oh, so the reviews actually happen annually. So they're periodic reports okay. that parties are supposed to submit. So obviously it's a UN convention, so it's like global. Uh, but when it comes to St. Kitts and Nevis, mm -hmm. we actually ratified the CEDAW convention in 1985. Mm -hmm. um, however, we've only submitted two reports, which is a bit shameful for us. But um, uh, oh, the first report was submitted in 2002. Mm -hmm. And then the second was actually just recently when I was, mm -hmm. I had recently traveled to Switzerland to actually deliver the report and have, uh, I guess it was questions and kind of uh, with the committee. So typically what happens, it's, you know, a UN forum and the committee members just kind of ask a series of questions based on the submitted report. And so mm -hmm. with that, there are 30 articles in the convention that mm -hmm. speak to different things. So it can speak to access to justice, uh, you know, the treatment of women when it comes to health care, um, employment opportunities, uh, stereotypes, uh, gender-based violence. So mm -hmm. there's a series of things um, that these articles speak to. And so committee members essentially ask questions around what is the state doing to address all of these things in these areas. So they're pretty much just checking in to see, well, what mm -hmm. are we doing? And then they offer also offer a number of recommendations as to how we can do better and improve our outcomes when it comes to um, the different areas, whether that's access to justice, law reform, mm -hmm. um, reproductive health rights, um, uh, and any kind of you know, institutional structural issues that we may have, whether that's programming. And so uh, that was a very interesting experience for mm -hmm. me, but that's essentially kind of the framework. Right, right. 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 Yeah. In terms of uh, you yourself, I think you just <laughs> spoke about how great of an experience it was, but it was your first year attending, correct? Yes, it was. It so was. in terms of how you felt in being around so many like-minded individuals mm -hmm. that had very similar agendas, 
Um, what was that like for you? Um, that was actually very rewarding for me. So, you know, my background is in uh, women and gender studies as well as my master's in policy development. So this was definitely a space actually being in a room with um, experts and tech people with, you know, technical expertise and understanding in the area of um, women and social development was actually very uh, edifying mm -hmm. for me. Um, and, you know, just to be able to have like-minded discussions because with people who understand the issues, uh, because uh, there were also uh, representatives from other Caribbean islands. So they were able to contextualize and relate in a way mm -hmm. so they would understand some of the challenges that we'd have contextually and frame their questions around that. So they're also very understanding and, you know, recommendations were noted in areas that we could do better. But I, I you know, it made me feel good. You mm -hmm. know, it was very uh, reinforcing and reaffirming in a lot of ways, but it's also a reiteration of how much work there is still to be done. Mm -hmm. right. Being on a big forum, such as that, did you in any way feel intimidated or you were ready for the show? Um, <laughs> well, personally, not, not so much. Oh, okay. um, I've uh, been in uh, international forums okay. previously before. I've participated in uh, Model United Nations when I was in university, so I had an idea of just what to, to expect just mm -hmm. structurally in that kind of regard, even though I was also still kind of not sure what to expect. Okay. Uh, but I wasn't uncomfortable at nice. all, uh, and I had really good support. So a staff person, Mrs. Warner, was with me from the department, and she had a wealth of knowledge. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I was able, so there wasn't a question where I was like, Oh, I felt like I was just hanging alone. So, and we also had uh, persons who were joined um, um, virtually from the department. So, the permanent secretary would have been there, and the director of policy planning, and the, the director of the department. So, we were always in contact. Thank nice. you to you know internet and Wi-Fi and just technology. Right. So, I was able to have that support, which I was grateful for because it really aided in my ability to respond to the questions. What makes you excited about your current position and future involvement with CEDAW? Um, so what makes me excited is just the fact that, you know, I am the Minister of Social Development and Gender Affairs, um, which, you know, allows me a position to influence the direction and trajectory when it comes to actually implementing some measures and doing programming and policies and laws that actually help to push and advance the agenda mm -hmm. of eliminating all forms of discrimination against mm -hmm. women. So I would have never expected to be in this position, but I'm here now and so I'm actually very excited for the opportunity to have that level of influence. And so I look forward to, you know, you know, being able to uh, work towards executing my vision for St. Kitts and Nevis when it comes to you know, women's participation in leadership in public and political life, when it comes to affording women social protection and you know, reducing and eliminating you know, gender-based violence and shifting culture and changing stereotypes when it comes to notions of toxic masculinity, um, and so, uh, you know, all of these things, you know, I, I, as part of my vision for, you know, uh, you know, better think it's an even yes. for our progress and advancement. And I'm, you know, excited and eager to be in a position where I'm able to connect with like-minded individuals at an international level who have experience in these things and who are able to offer recommendations and encouragement and support. Um, and then to be able to also return to the Federation to the support of you know, a prime minister and a cabinet who also share that vision and also with a department that's willing to do the work mm -hmm. um, and has been, you know, doing their best with the resources mm -hmm. that they have had to, 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 to execute and to make improvements and advancements. So, you know, I'm just kind of looking for opportunities to see where we can do better um, and mm -hmm. see what we need to be able to do better and, you know, see how we can shift the narrative and shift the culture. Um, and I know that's one of the hardest things to change. Culture is one of the hardest things to shift, and so right. it takes time. Yes. Um, but, you know, I'm willing to contribute where I can, and my hope is that whatever, if my tenure is just five years, that at least at the end of that, I'll be able to say, okay, so at least we moved the gamut from here to here, yes. and that's one step forward. Um, right. And, you know, I'll be happy with that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to root for 10. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the talking points was the Rural Women's Development Program. Yes. What does this mean? Um, so one of the areas for the CEDAW Convention is they do ask um, a look, a looking at um, mm -hmm. rural women um, and you know their involvement in social life. So because you know they, they call them rural women, just you know persons who live in you know non-urban areas, yes. and so. 
um, in the context of St. Kitts and Nevis, we want to think, when we think about rural women's development, we actually like to think a lot more about how we can get more women involved in things like agriculture, mm -hmm. um, especially as entrepreneurs in that area, in that regard. And so uh, because we're talking about agriculture, that's just an area for you know, inter-ministerial collaboration and partnership. Um, we also think about making sure that women who live in rural areas have access to resources, have access to things like healthcare, have access to education, have access to financing, so that it's able, so that we ensure that they are not uh, prevented mm -hmm. from uh, being able to uplift and empower themselves just because of where they live um, geographically. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about that, so again, in the context of saying good news, it's like, you know, how do we get more women? into you know employable spaces like agriculture we see more agriculture than in rural areas because that's where the land is um, making sure that you know they do have access to health institutions reproductive health care financing and so that they're just not forgotten that we don't yes. focus on just you know yes. um, urban <laughs> development and women who live in you know Bastia or those you know suburban areas i have a follow-up question have you started any programs for the rural women as yet um, specifically from the Department of Gender Affairs, not specifically for rural women. Okay. Um, however, we do have, um, we do know that and support and have had connections and collaborations with organizations that uh, do cater to rural women. So uh, on the agric agricultural front, so we know that there's an organization in St. Paul, it's called Capistia Women, okay. and they do focus on, um, you know, women farming, um, as well as just kind of women's upliftment and empowerment programs. So, so they have a nice little network there. And I know recently, um, Helen's Daughters, which is a yeah. regional agricultural organization, yeah. launched a St. Kitts and Nevis chapter. And that also is um, a women-focused, women-centered farming initiative program. And these are things that are just kind of endorsed by the Department of Gender Affairs. Okay. And so um, in terms of our own work, we do ensure that we have, we provide access. So we have satellite offices for social services mm -hmm. to make sure that we have available offices for people located in the rural areas so that they're able to access social services um, if they need. And so that's kind of what we're doing in that regard. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Are there current discussions to legislate the inclusion of adequate representation of women in government and politics as some of our country counterparts have done? OK, so this is a good question. Um, are there discussions? So there are no outright objections to uh, implementing, this is what we'd call something like a temporary special measures. Mm -hmm. And this was something that did come up uh, at the CEDAW convention in the committee. And that's something that they were encouraging St. Kitts and Nevis to do. Mm -hmm. So currently, we don't have uh, a real definitive plan to implement things like quotas and legislate that. Um, however, it's, that doesn't mean that it's not up for discussion. I think we, you know, we do have a prime minister who has, on multiple occasions, expressed his desire to see um, greater equity when it comes to women's involvement in political yes. life and women's involvement in leadership, they're being on boards as CEOs, and in that respect. And so the political will is there. Right. Um, and you know, I think it has been demonstrated with uh, the prime minister's selection of persons in cabinet. And even on, we see board, statutory board membership. Mm -hmm. In a way, you can even see there are more women than men mm -hmm. um, on, in some of these boards. And so the political will is there. So I wouldn't say that the discussion is off the table. It mm -hmm. just has not been had in any great detail at this point in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. How important do you think it is that women be included in policies and decision making in government? Oh, I think it's absolutely uh, in integral. Um, I think, you know, having women included in these discussions, you know, women represent, you know, almost, you know, 50 percent, or even in some instances, more than 50 percent of populations. Uh, depending on the ju jurisdiction. And so you cannot have discussions about uh, policy development, about you know, uh, plans for development or sustainability without having that representation. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and similarly, when, you know, since I am the Minister of Youth, I would make that plug for youth as well. You know, uh, you have to have these people at the table because, you know, if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu, as yeah. you know, we like to say. And so it is absolutely important. And I think, too, particularly for women, because, you know, we have a perspective that naturally men don't have. Right. Um, you know, 
we you know we have to acknowledge so in my you know i i always advocate for equity yes. because i recognize that you know you know males and females you know we are equal in value but we're not equal in function yes, and indeed. ability indeed, it's just sure. that's just a biological yes. fact yes. and so you know things that you know i think so we but we always need balance i believe we always need balance in terms of you know the male and female perspective as in you know masculine and feminine energies because mm. that's just the way the world is and so i think it is absolutely important to have women at the table and different women from different demographics yes. because you know we women experience the world differently as well Indeed. so it's absolutely important and we have to be at the table so uh, i advocate for that yeah. always so, yeah. And as a follow-up to your question mm -hmm. in terms of the actual training and policies being put in place to eliminate the discrimination within St. Kitts and Nevis, mm -hmm. um, what does that look like, I guess, currently and then moving forward? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a good question. So, I mean, so currently we know, so there are some glaring things that we have to address in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, Gender-based violence is a real problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's not talked about enough but it happens all the time, every day. The way we deal with it uh, is, you know, we, we need to be take a much stronger stance in terms of how we respond to reports of domestic violence and abuse. Um, we need to, you know, the, the, the way that we adjudicate um, and kind of respond to these issues and even just public education. Mm -hmm. Public education for just individuals to understand that it's not okay to be in, you know, yes. violent relationships, mm -hmm. that it's not okay to be violent. Yes. Um, that education needs to be ongoing. That's mm -hmm. a major, major aspect and a piece of shifting the culture. And so in relation to that um most immediately especially since most recently we would have had two unfortunate deaths um, as a result of domestic yes. violence where an alleged perpetrator would have lost his life yes. and an actual um, victim of abuse would have lost her life one in singles and one in nevis yes. um, and so um, with that um, we're expecting, so on um, Friday is the next parliament sitting and domestic violence legislation is actually up for some amendments. So we're actually looking at the legislation that we have around domestic violence and seeing where we can strengthen that legislation to ensure um, that the access to justice for um, victims of abuse can, uh, are able to access justice to file for um, protection orders yes. a lot more easily, yeah. um, as well as just kind of uh, in this initial amendment, we're amending some definitions mm -hmm. um, so that it's a bit broader. And so uh, the, the definition of things like economic abuse is a bit broader so that we recognize, you know, the different types of abuse that can happen to restrain women and men um, who experience, you know, unhealthy relationships or in unhealthy domestic situations. And so that is, you know, an initial step um, nice. that we're taking. And of course, you know, once we have the legislative frame, we're also looking to see how within the Department of Gender Affairs, we build capacity so that we can improve programming um, and to see how we can work a lot more closely with the police and the Special Victims Unit yes. so that hopefully we can deliver some sensitivity training mm -hmm. so that officers are a lot more equipped to be able to respond more sensitively to cases um, of reports, um, as well as you know, looking at how we can uh, develop some kind of broader education, mm -hmm. public education around domestic violence in that campaign. So we definitely work closely with uh, the Department of Gender in Nevis, and that's you know, a really strong relationship. I would have already had a m meeting with um, my counterpart, Minister Hazel Brandy Williams, mm -hmm. who's the Minister of Gender Affairs in Nevis, um, and her team as well. So you know, we are seeing how you know, I think together we make mm -hmm. a stronger Good impact stuff. than you know, um, in silos yes, on exactly. two islands. And so, they do a lot of good things in Nevis, especially around education and campaigns. So to see how we can learn from each other and support each other. And, and of course, you know, this is actually, um, this month we'll be celebrating the International Men's Day. Yes. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to gender affairs, I think a lot of times people think it's just about women, but yes. men are vital to the conversation. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, they are vital. And so we need to recognize our upstanding men, um, encourage them to be more mentors to our yes, boys. Indeed. Because if we're wanting to shift culture, then like I said, we need to shift notions of what it means to be a man and what masculinity looks like um, and, you know, eradicate these stereotypes. 
um, that, that we would have grown up with from colonial slavery yes, times. Right. And so all of that is part of the conversation and all of that is part of the thrust. And so, you know, it's a lot, but you know, <laughs> uh, one step at a time. <laughs>